Uh, welcome to the Growing the Future podcast. I'm today's host. My name is Dan Eberhartz. Um, the Growing the Future podcast, where our future is always bigger than our past. Uh, thanks for joining us on season three, episode 15. Do not forget to check out our social media channels. Give us a follow on YouTube where you can catch this video and, and all the other episodes on video. Go to growingthefuturepodcast.ca to find all of our previous episodes and you can become a Growing the Future Insider there. We'll email you when we have a new episode published. Today, my guest is a man of many talents and endeavors. He has been around the grain operations and crop input scene since 1990 in various management roles. He's been a partner in the iron industry at the dealership level. He founded Agritrend Marketing, advising producers on grain markets, budgeting and cash flow. And he also consults for a variety of companies in this space. In one of his more recent roles, he oversaw the elevator operations and export sales of approximately half a billion. That's a nice big round number. He's also been my little brother, Terry's market coach at Aberhart Farms since 2006. So he's, he's, a, he's a family friend near and dear, a loyal and trusted advisor through lots of different ups and downs in the market. And uh, him and Terry collaborate together quite well, as I understand it. Um, that's that's an amazing relationship over a decade and a half. So we just had Dave Wall, the storage and handling expert on last, last episode. Now we've got the actual market coach, grain market coach. Today, we're going to talk about the grain markets, the 2021 season, contracting grain, and this whole sustainability ecosystem Derek Squire is working on developing on behalf of producers as we sort of morph into the next generation of food production and and food production channels. Very exciting conversation ahead. Derek Squire, welcome to the show. Mm, thanks for having me, Dan. I appreciate it. Look forward to it. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be great. Uh yeah. so many questions, and it's kind of funny because I went on Twitter last night. And uh if you stick around till the end of the episode, we're gonna try and answer it very directly. Uh, some some people's questions for for market coaches in general, and it's a very yeah. interesting time to be a market yeah. coach. I'm sure it's been an interesting ride overall uh, for the last however many decades for you, but yeah. this year especially would be a really crazy roller coaster. Tell us a little bit about your journey getting here and how you work with folks like my brother. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, I started in the grain business, and I. I uh, Worked for Saskatchewan Wheat Pool way back in the day, and and uh, cut my teeth in grain elevator operations, and then and then started into uh, I, I did my uh, CCA, and and so I, I did a lot of fertilizer uh, uh, work in in uh, the late '90s, and 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 then from there I went to a company called Conagra, and really got into merchandising, and and uh, uh, ran operations for Conagra, but did a lot of merchandising, international merchandising overseas, and we did a program, and I'm you know you know that we're going to allude to some of these these programs, but we did a program called Navigator Durham back in the day, and. And it was a uh, a high gluten Durham that that we sold into Italy, and so so you know from there we we started you know, Conagra had a company called IP.com, and and we did a lot of very uh, uh, specific qualities for different areas around the world, and so I learned that cutting my teeth with Conagra and merchandising around the world, and then from there I uh, worked with Cargill and and uh, as a director of operations, and and then from there I started Agritrend in two thousand and five. So, uh, partnered with Rob Syke and and the crew, you know Terry and and the, and the uh, the agronomy team, and so we you know built a, a network of people there that that uh, is still together today. So we're working together. So Terry and I started working together right around that same time, and um, and and just that network just grew and grew and and uh, yeah, and, and the you know the farm has done very well in the last fifteen years, and and proud to say that I'm a part of it. <laughs> Hey, I'm glad you're helping. I mean, this is literally translating into my non-farming sibling uh, bank account as as a uh, inheritance one day. I think so. You know, the plus or minus on that is is very relevant to my life. Well, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see how that all pans out. But different episode, different conversation. Tell us a little bit about what exactly your role is as a market coach, because I feel sometimes like this isn't always clear. Is your job to predict the market? Is your job to coach human behavior is your job you know to hit the the peaks in the valleys like what do you do as a market coach so we set budgets right off the bat and we're looking at cash flow we're looking at return on investment 
Uh, and that's where the cost of production is important is the return on investment side. But, and we're really, we're really pushing, you know, we're really looking at grain markets and looking for the top revenue, but all opt we're there to optimize and, and to make sure that there's risk in your work. And this year is a perfect example of that, that, you know, there's, there's risk in, in forward contracting. And, and so we need to manage that risk constantly year, uh, year round. And, and so that's, you know, a lot of people don't realize uh, that, you know, that we are managing risk as well. And, and really by, um, you know, some of the contracts we have with active gods and things like that, we're, we're managing risk to make sure that they're, uh, the optimizing, not, you know, not always maximizing, but putting yourself at huge risk, but optimizing and making sure that the, the, the farm is, is looked after. And we're really managing, uh, you know, cash flow down the road as well to make sure that, because you know it has operating cash flow, so it's not just about hitting the high of the market every time, every month. It's a matter of of having uh, you know hitting the highs of the market, but also making sure that we're not at risk and and we have significant cash flow coming in, and we have delivery opportunities, storage opportunities. So Terry and I get into all the logistics around the farm as well, the drying and the cleaning and and the binning and you know uh, hauling grain at minus forty and things like that that we're trying to get away <laughs> from, right? So. So we, we manage all that. And so the, it's the business of farming. It's not just grain, grain marketing. It's everything that goes with what's going on at the farm. That's what I wonder when this whole concept of, of coaching comes up. I think that's a very specific word with a lots of uh, implications. I mean, what problem are you really helping producers solve? Because who, who would want to be making decisions about selling grain and how to mar- approach the, mar- the gargantuan market as a lone Wolf, th- especially this year, and and, and fortunes yeah. this year, as far as I can tell, are going to be won and, and going to be lost. We'll talk a little bit more in th- about that in detail, but seems like a lot of fortunes are going to be won and lost, not just on yield this year as much, because there's a lot of different ways that you can manage low yield, but the contracts are the killer mm-hmm. this year. What problem yeah. are you actually solving for producers as a coach? Yeah, so... You know, to start that, you know, we we're very careful on on how much we forward contract, and and this year was is we we're especially uh, you know cognizant of that because we've got high pri- prices from last year going into this year. We've got we had low subsoil moisture going into this year, so we were pretty careful with that. In certain areas, we were more you know maybe you know areas had better subsoil moisture. We were a little bit more aggressive than than other areas, depending on. So we we manage that you know farm by farm. Um, so so yeah we're 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 cognizant of all that um you know we we weren't oversold a whole lot this year um you know but we do it with production contracts and act of god so you can get a lot of those prices with having protection you know act of god contracts for example uh they 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 you know have uh fine print in there that cover you for drought hail those types of things. Uh, so we do as many of those again. Production contracts are the same thing. We have production contracts. There's certain commodities like lentils, peas, malt barley. Those commodities have production contracts with them, and they're tied to production. And and so you're you don't have to to uh, to deliver on those contracts if you had a, an act of God situation. We also will you know anything like wheat and canola that if we're forward priced we have ability to rebuy that product with futures and options. So in a lot of cases, if we were to sell $20 canola off the combine, for example, and it starts to go to $21 or $22, you can reown paper and futures or options and capitalize on that upside. So that's, you know, that's the, the, the next thing or the, the, the marketing 201 that, that uh, guys don't really see that next, you know, behind the scenes stuff that's going on with futures and options, how to manage your risk with that. In my conversations with producers, on one hand, you have a large grain farm, say 15 to 20,000 acres that's going to make, that are going to make 4 million bucks this year. On mm-hmm. the other hand, there's the same size of farm elsewhere that is going to, oh, like is upside down the same amount of money yeah. <laughs> one yeah. farm is going to be advancing and buying land and had the windfall of their lifetime the other one you know i can't imagine i can't imagine you know we tie yeah. we tie ourselves to to our land and our our yield and our and everything associated with what we do i mean i can't imagine the heartache what is the difference right. what what happened there so you know, obviously production is going to be a big part of that you know if if you know there's going to be areas 
that have had are going to have decent crops this year, and there's going to be areas that got absolutely devastated. So, so that's the, the first thing that you know the big swings. Um, you're going to have uh, you know a lot of these contracts that we have in place, like I mentioned, they're going to be uh, act of God, and you can and and you can get out of that if you're if you're the in the areas that got devastated, you can mitigate that that big swing downwards, you know, to a break even type number on a year like this. Um, if you have proper insurance, like the, you know, that's the other thing is that, that we watch is is your insurance risk, and and so there's certain commodity or certain insurance companies out there that manage a lot of these forward contract uh, have insurance for forward contracts. So if you have that, I mean you're you're you, you get insurance for forward contracting not being able to to supply it. So it's again it's risk management, and you know if if the guys that are really going to get hurt this year maybe don't have that that type of insurance. Uh, and B, their own production, of course, uh, that I'd mentioned, or they they got too aggressive on on forward contracting and and have buyouts, and and so you know you you got to put all that in a bag and say, okay, well, what what kind of risk are you willing to take on this year? And 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 you know that's you know I said at the outset of the the conversations, we manage risk and make sure that we're not hanging our butts out there too far at any one time. I've seen a lot on on social media about farmers' position and a lot of conversation in the open coffee shop that is, uh, you know, largely Twitter, I guess, conversationally. Or, you know, you can go on 306 SAS Farmers or 204 Manitoba Farmers or 403 Mm -hmm. Alberta Farmers on Facebook. I've seen a lot of that side of it. But what what position are the grain companies in and what are they doing to manage the situation to help producers out? So, yeah, the the grain companies... Are, are are resellers, and so they're 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 buying product from the from producers, obviously, and 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 then reselling to export positions. Um, so they they'll have depending on their positions, they'll have commitments to end use buyers, and and depending on their relationships with those buyers, they may or may not have those force majeure contracts as well, right? Kind of a, it's an act of God with the producer. So depending on the commodity and the country that you're selling to, they could be uh, you know, be out of some of those contracts or they need to, you know, commit depending on, you know, if it's, you know, China typically, you know, doesn't really let you out of contracts, you know, so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you, gotta, you, gotta <laughs> you know, you gotta, you gotta perform on those ones. Right. So, so depending yeah. on who they sold to and what kind of contracts they've got in place, they're either in good positions or bad positions. And again, managing risk on their side. So, so in, in you know a lot of them are you know early on when we were asking about contract buyouts and the, those types of things um, you know they were we were getting no wait till harvest is is complete or uh, or or just crazy uh, buyout numbers and and you know the the mark to market but then also a huge admin fee cost like anywhere I heard up to one hundred and twenty dollars right. a ton for admin fee cost like and anywhere from right. eighty to one hundred twenty it was huge and it was it was ridiculous so. Um, now I think that the grain companies are, you know, harvest is, is underway. Uh, they are, they've taken a position that, okay, well, if you're looking to reown the product, if you, if we have, if you have the, the, the product that in the bin or have it in the, in the field, um, we're, we'll, we'll, we don't want to re let you speculate on our cash contracts. Right. So that's why they were had all these high admin fees. Now they're realizing that the, the the, the devastate you know the devastated areas are bigger than what they thought, and they're they're coming to the table a little bit more with some reasonable buyout numbers on admin fees and things like that because the producers legit don't have the product and they're just going to be short these contracts, and and so I think you know they're coming around and I think the the, the grain companies need to do that because this is a one in thirty year event and. And you know you you don't want to you know those those guys are suppliers in the in the in the big picture they're suppliers and you don't want to bankrupt your suppliers, so they need to come out with you know next year they're talking about act of God contracts in wheat never had that in in grain before so we've had it in lentils and peas and and malt like I mentioned, but to have it in meat wheat or canola, um, there's risk programs. Um, available now for next year with Nexera and and some of the things they're doing with with uh, some some different insurance companies, which I think is very in, in innovative. And and so from this year, there's going to be innovative contracts next year that that put more risk on the grain companies and less risk on producers. 
Interesting. I always think about the secondary consequences of everything that's unfolding here, and I, I kind of wonder is because of this drought and if there's a breakdown in the in the supply chain, does that affect our ability as a nation to export product to those customers? Is there ripples out there if we can't deliver or if we break our word or, or something of that effect? I, I know everybody's feeling it at the local level, but but hey, it's capitalism globally, and we we are – we are a supplier to customers around the world, uh, big countries. How, how does that go down? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, we're a supply chain, right? I, I mentioned suppliers and 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 the resellers and then the exporters. You know, we're a supply chain, and and we need to be reliable. And 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 we do have a very good reputation for that today. So Canada has a very good reputation for for shipping on spec and quality and shipping it on time. Uh, we don't want to. We don't want to ruin that. Um, so, yeah, yeah, you're you're right. Absolutely right. It, it's very critical that we're able to do you know to to execute on a lot of these contracts. So, um, it's a it's a give and take relationship. We've got to we've got to work with them, and they got to work with us. And and so I feel that we're doing that this year. Um, and 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 look at the long term. You know, we're looking at at deferring uh, contracts and those types of things into next year. So. Um, you know, they'll get the product and there's just different ways of, of mitigating some of the damages and things like that for the long haul. Mm. I wonder for producers that, that are working with various experts and producers that aren't, what do you, what's the biggest fundamental difference between those that are sort of assembling uh, a board of advisors, if you will, like my brother has done. I mean, he's mm -hmm. got Evan Schout from Maverick, who's uh, the CFO. He's got yourself helping with uh, grain marketing. He's got uh, a fellow from Calgary who's installed entrepreneurial operating system, right? Yeah. And and two of his companies. Um, you know, he's got a board of advisors that includes you know Rob Sake, Rick Pattison, uh, Jurg Zimmerman, um, Evan Shout. Like it's amazing. So at least mm -hmm. you know my brother always preaches to me if we've made a shitty decision and avoid it's all on you but if <laughs> at least if you make a poor decision you can you know you know three fingers point at yourself but the finger can also go around the table mm -hmm. what do you see is a big difference between people who have a network of support like that and and everybody that's on their own and what do you see the difference well you think about family farms and what the family farm looked like even 10 or 15 years ago um, and so it's a one man show, right? You've got a general manager or CEO, whatever you want to call that guy that's making all those decisions. You think about you know, how many dollars are involved in, in those decisions and, and it's multi millions, right? And, and, and so it's a big corporation and for us to not act like a corporation or farm, not to act like a corporation is kind of, you know, it's kind of strange when you think about that, how many dollars are involved, how many big decisions are involved and how many, you know, if you look at a corporation, you've got. Like you said, an advisory board, board of directors, you've got senior management, you've got middle management, you've got junior management. So you've got a lot of those people that are helping you with those decisions. And I think that's what Terry's doing. And that's, you know, what the, the big farms do well is they've gone, they've gone to that next level. They're, they're, you know, it's, it's more than putting seed in the ground and taking it off in the fall. It's all the business decisions of land and finances and, you know, rent or own, rent to own or, or lease and all those decisions that come with, with running a big operation, human resources, it's, it's ongoing. And, and so I think that's what, you know, the, the, you know, the, you know, the, the good farmers are, are really, you know, striving to be better and, and bringing in good people to help them make good decisions. Derek, we're going to circle back to some of the specific questions that producers had for you on Twitter, and I think that's going to answer a lot of the, the in-detail questions that producers might have right now wondering about their situation on their farm in Western Canada today. Mm -hmm. But let's just expand a bit the conversation a little bit to some of the opportunities that you see on the for coming on the forefront here on the horizon that you've been also working to facilitate, whether it's with Terry or the broader industry in general, you are working towards a consortium of, of sustainability, if you will, that is going to reward the producer financially, if I'm, if I'm not correct here. Tell us right. a little bit about where that puck is going so people can get on this train and get paid. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Where's the money? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so uh, you know, and that that's a great segue into you know what's what you know you talk about um, you know corporations and 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 farmers getting big and and how do we capitalize on that and and you know the, you know good decisions and 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 new markets coming available. So so we're working on on you know you know there's 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 many companies out there. And I'll name one. General Mills is a great company to work with that 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 is is really about sustainability and 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 making sure that they have high quality oats, uh, but also that it's grown sustainably. And and today, you know, sustainable is a bit of a buzzword. You know, we you know what does that really mean? And I think that we're going to quantify that here going forward with a lot of different products. And um, uh, they want to know that the that, that there's a you know NERP protocols followed for, with with fertilizer that the safe fertilizers are out there the low salt fertilizers uh, they've got lots of different criteria but there's there's money at the end of the day so you know to to follow all these these protocols and and have you know quality oats that that uh, they want to grow or they want to to buy. Uh, there's premiums at the end of the day, and there's many examples of that. Bungie and high oil content canola, um, you know, wheat and low residue herbicides. You know, we're we're working on on the, those types of, of markets, and and I feel that those we're doing that internationally today, and 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 feel that there's a huge opportunity for that coming for, going forward. The gap is the farmer getting paid, and in my my understanding is from talking to producers and, and, and watching the conversation on social media, there's not a lot, of, there's not a lot of optimism about getting paid for any of this. How are you going to quantify it? And how are people getting paid? And if you have examples, that's great. Cause I'm sure that's what people are wondering. Yeah. So, I, you know, once we get into the traceability piece today, um, it's hard to prove it today. And so I think we're going to get into traceability and blockchain. And I think blockchain is, is something that's coming on the software side that is going to put more, uh, more of a stick in the producer's hands, if you will, right. Or more on the logistics side, you know, you're going to have more, uh, the ownership longer down the, the food chain and the value chain. So, so there is examples today of, of dollars going into producers' pockets. There's, you know, there's oil content in, in with Bungie that there there is an oil premium today that, that there's that's going into producers' pockets. The General Mills example, there's money going into producers' pockets today. It's not huge. It's not, you know, it's not, you know, and especially with this market today, uh, you know, a dollar a bushel doesn't sound like a heck of a lot when you're when we're going up and down a dollar a bushel a week pretty much. But in when as <laughs> uh, you know, normal markets, I'll call it. Those are big dollars, and 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 so there is premiums today. I think once we get more traceability and and in the in the the market, um, the, the 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 food market can get the value from uh, you know food sources that is that's sustainable and well, I'll, I'll give it organic is a is a great example. It's they're they're paying more money for the food at the grocery shelf, and and so I feel that there's going to be a a subset of organic. It won't be organic, but it'll be something that this product is grown healthy and and safe, and there and it might be ninety percent of the value of organic food in the grocery shelf, and then those dollars will trickle down to the people that are 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 making them safe foods and the low low herbicide that I mentioned. Those types of things. There's going to be premiums in the market for that. Um, eventually, uh, we've got to, you know, we've got to you know, develop the market and, you know, so we work on that, uh, uh, internationally and I, but I think it's coming. And, and like I said, there's going to be different subsets of organic, uh, sustainable, regenerative food safety, all those different attributes. And there's going to be seven, 10 of them out there, but, but if the consumer will pay for, for those products and have safe food and know they're safe and they can, they can scan a barcode and, and, and know where it came from Eberhardt, Eberhardt farms, for example, um, they'll pay more for that. And I think that trickles down to the producer. What is the meaning or definition of these tiers? You mentioned organic, sustainable, regenerative. It seems like yeah. regenerative is where a lot of these companies are now starting to evolve to or go to recognizing that, you know, God bless organic production. There's a lot of good points about that, but that's sort of on the other extreme end where, let's be fair, I don't know that organic production has been about building soil health. Now they're talking about soil health, regenerative. Is that going to be the moniker? Is that going to be the umbrella? 
Is that going to be the metric? And what is the metric of regenerative that you're using? And is my brother already regenerative? Lots of questions there, but I'll let you unpack that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, it, Terry's going along down that road. Like he's, he's working on regenerative ag and, and, and experimenting with it and, 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 and knowing, you know, on the soil side, right? So on the soil side, he's doing those things, make sure you know, that, you know, those two crops, you know, if he's doing cover crops or two, two, um, uh, you know, cover crops and, and making sure that it's, it's, it's uh, financially viable to do that and good for the soil. So, so I do think that that's going to be the, the new piece. It's not just about, uh, organics or or the the you know the food quality, but where it came from and and so there's a lot of ESG out there today, right? And environmentally social governance that that you know a lot of those buyers and I'll use General Mills again uh, that want to know that the soil is is in good shape and and that you didn't use high uh, salt. Uh, uh, phosphate. You're losing, using low salt phosphate, or you're you're using you know uh, you know NERP protocols for nitrous oxide. Those types of things. They want to know those things because their customers want to know those things, and and that's where you know I think sustainable and regenerative are going to go. I think we're going to have uh, you know get away from using those words and and have more of a protocol that that says okay if you did this this and this to your crop you will get X. And if you did this and you, and you fall into this category, you'll get why. And and I think that's, you know, we need to d- define that as an industry and not just talk about sustainability and regenerative and organic for that matter, but, but define it and track it, trace it, um, uh, have, you know, a lot of the blockchain that I mentioned earlier has quality control all the way through, right, from producer to uh, elevator, elevator to processor, and so on. They have quality control checks in there all the way through to make sure that that product is what it says it is. You don't have that in in the food industry today, and I think that's coming. Love it. Well, I think it's really exciting all the stuff that you help my brother with. I mean, obviously, he's found a lot of value in that relationship over a decade and a half, and all these other opportunities, all of these other things that you're working to bring together is, is very exciting. And we need people like you that has an understanding uh, of the markets that has the proper tools to understand uh, what needs to be done and also has relationships with producers that could connect it all to get people paid one day for their good work of making soil uh, truly regenerative where it can produce more and more uh, over the years instead of being degraded on a number of levels. Derek, there's been a ton of talk about carbon, and yes, you know, the carbon molecule in the cow cycle is different than the carbon molecule in a car, <laughs> where you take it out of the ground and put it into a car and it goes up into the atmosphere. I, my general impression is that producers are dubious that the carbon markets are going to be good for them and that there's anything of value there, and it's sort of overblown. It's carbon, 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 carbon is the solution to all of our problems. What's your take on carbon, Derek? So, uh, as we talked about in in food sustainability, and 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 the the buyer wants to know, they they want to know about carbon as well. They want to know, um, you know, if if uh, they they want to be carbon neutral. And you know, talking about you know large food companies want to be carbon neutral. So they want to know that their suppliers are carbon neutral. And I think that there's going to be money available for producers uh, for you know helping them achieve their goals. And so you see lots of uh, you know, companies by 2030, they want to be carbon neutral and, and, you know, those type of type of claims and, and, uh, and st- stances in the market, um, there's the, the, and their, their shareholders are going to hold them accountable for the accountable for those things. And so they need to hit those goals and they need the producers help to do it. And so I think that there's going to be opportunity for producers, uh, to, um, have, you know, products, that that allowed them to to get more carbon credits and 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 you know today you know regulatory markets are trading in that forty dollar range uh, and voluntary markets are in that seven to ten dollar range. We feel that the, the market's going to take off and the demand is going to be super strong here from those those uh, those food companies that that you know they're going to pay upwards of eighty to a hundred dollars a uh, a ton for those and the voluntary on the regulatory market at 80 to a hundred dollars a ton, the voluntary would be 40 to 50. So it's real money that producers can put in their pockets by farming a little bit different. I mean, just a little bit more efficient with fertilizer. Um, and, and, you know, just some of the crops that they're growing, they sequester more carbon into the soil. Uh, some of their tilling practices, those types of things, uh, is going to be advan- advantageous to producers. Awesome. 
Was there anything else you wanted to add about carbon at all? Like, is there a specific way that producers would move towards that now, getting ahead of the curve? Or how do you suggest somebody like my brother move in that direction? So, well, he's he's doing a lot of that today on his on his tillage protocols, and and so so that's the biggest one today. Um, but if he's losing using um, low salt fertilizers, uh, you know, like uh, uh, rock phosphate, bio salt, you know, products like that, there's there's more any you know that's going to add to uh, plant growth and it's going to car- uh, uh, get more carbon into the ground and 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 he can measure that. There's voluntary protocols that, c- that he can measure that and and apply for for a carbon credit and he gets paid. Awesome. Well, it certainly doesn't hurt to use some bio salt. We we second that. Amen. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Here we go on the Growing the Future podcast, a Twitter lightning round where we have our expert, (laughs) our guest on the episode, who happens to be Derek Squire, who's been the grain marketing coach uh, at Eberhard Farms, working with my brother since 2006. We're going to ask Derek these questions directly from folks on Twitter that wanted to have these questions answered by a grain market coach. So this is his raw (laughs) <laughs> and as real as it gets, folks. So here we go. Devin Walker asks, before we knew we were in a drought, we had $20 canola, we had $7 wheat, we had $8 peas, we had $5 barley. Now without now with full-on drought, we, we still have $20 canola. And the other crops have doubled. Was canola artificially inflated before? Or is it artificially depressed now? There isn't 14.8 million metric tons out there so last year uh we we had a uh, an average crop or you know slightly above average crop and we had these you know amazingly high prices and, and especially in canola took off where you know others may you know they took off as well but it were a little flatter than canola and it was all about demand and and specifically chinese demand and and so they had a production problem last year had some flooding some typhoons late august so so went through the whole growing season realize you know thinking that okay everything looks all right around the world and then they had some late production problems in their rapeseed growing areas and their corn growing areas their soybean growing areas you know and so some pretty crucial areas got hit with some flooding and it happened like i said it happened in in late august and and so we saw that in in about November December we saw that demand really kick in, and it was unexpected demand that the market um, didn't expect. You know they they had their sales are projected off to different countries, and then when when uh, and typically they bought about two million tons or they had China pegged in for a couple million tons and they came in and bought about four point five million tons. So that's two million tons that we had to come up with and the market had to come up with and that's what you know a bit of a squeeze on who's going to get what for canola so we saw that uh last year this year uh different problem right now you got production problem in canada and and so that so the market's anticipating um not enough canola this year and that 14.8 million tons stats can number that just came out you know, you know, I, I think it's going to come down as well. I think that's, you know, that, that's typically USDA and StatsCan MO is they, they'll start at a number and slowly ratchet it down until they feel that they got the right number. <laughs> um, um, so, <laughs> strange but true. Um, they certainly did. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. So, so it's a different problem this year. It's a product. It's a production problem in Canada, and and so that demand hasn't kicked in yet. Out of China, out of Pakistan, out of Mexico, out of the states, hasn't come kicked in yet. But it will, and there's going to be some price rationing that needs to happen, especially if we go to a, you know, twelve point five million ton number or some version of that, twelve point five to thirteen thirteen million tons. Um, there's price rationing that needs to happen so that. Uh, you know, harvest canola harvest is just getting started here now, so nobody really knows that number yet. I think by the end of harvest, the, the market will know that number, and and then you'll start to see it re- react one way or the or the other. Great background, very interesting. Question from Ron Cron: Why does a market coach focus so much on cost of production? The market doesn't care about cost of production. Once decision is made to grow a crop where cost of production is absolutely critical in making that decision, the goal is to maximize 
dollars received within risk tolerance of grower. Mm-hmm. Derek. So, so what, you know, as I mentioned earlier that you know, we manage risk and, and we need to know where that risk is. And as a, as a, a guy helping uh, making those decisions, uh, risk reward. And, and so if we know that you're making 25 or 30% return on investment or $120 per acre, uh, knowing that you've paid all your bills and you still have $120 an acre left, then, then it's it's easier to check off the boxes. I guess we've got a criteria of things that we we go through to know uh, when to market grain or to pull the trigger. And 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 if we're hitting those kinds of return on investments, uh, it's okay to take a little bit of risk on. And and so so that's the balance that we do every day. Um, so we need to know that number. I agree with Ron that that it is about hitting the top number all the time. But we do need to. Uh, optimize and not always maximize and you know because maximizing and putting it yourself at a lot of risk especially on a year like this is a lot different than optimizing and you know making sure that that you don't get caught you know buying out a contract or something like that as well so so we're very careful with that on the on the the risk reward and and you need to know all the information good good justification i like it <laughs> matt gosling asks <laughs> Your good buddy Matt, our good buddy Matt. Good buddy, Matt. How much new crop should one sell for 2022 after some hard lessons in 2021? Mm-hmm. So it, yeah, there's I, I I think that there's going to be contracts available to producers next year with Act of God in them. You know, I think that the the you know we've learned lessons on both sides. Producers and grain buyers are learning lessons from a year like this, one in 30 years that you know for, for for grain companies to get the producer back to the table to to contract for next year they're going to have to come up with um uh more risk adverse contracts for producers so i think that that there'll be an act of god on canola at 22 bucks a bushel and for, to get producers to sign those I, I would be looking for something like that next year great to hear there's going to be some improvements made after all the challenges this year Mm-hmm. Ian Donovan asks, "How high will spring wheat go?" Um, spring wheat is a is a, a different animal. It's you know we I'll use Durham or malt barley or things like that that are as an example of things that are made in Canada that are I mean you know if we are short in Canada the you know lentils is a great example. If we're short in Canada, the world's short. And um, where, where wheat's a different animal, um, if you know, to put it in perspective, we grow about 30 million tons of wheat, and uh, there's about 980 million tons of production in the world a year. So, um, you know, there is replacements for high quality spring wheat. There can be high quality or high protein winter wheat and, and products like that that can be, it can replace it in the world. So, it's really more of a domestic feed issue in Canada than it is about world international wheat price. Kelvin Hanna asks, why do you enjoy staring at charts all day? Well, I don't stare at charts all day. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's, uh, there's, there's technical, which is staring at charts all day. And there's fundamental, which is, you know, the practical supply and demand side. And, and so we balance both and, and, you know, that we, we're typically, I would say we're more like 65% fundamental, 35% technical that, that, um, uh, the fundamental supply and demand is really what what is the macro moves in the world, and and you know we've talked about uh, production problems or demand ish, you know demand uh, increased demand, and that's really what drives long term price. The technicals is really what drives uh, short term uh, pricing breaks and on the on the charts analysis. So so we do watch technicals, but it's it's more short term uh, uh, than it is long term fundamental price. Uh, discovery. You mean you can't get rich when you have the proper candlestick formation and a crossover on the 50, <laughs> uh, 50 uh, slow, slow moving average and a divergence on the MACD? <laughs> Yes, you can do all that, that's, but that then there's somebody plan. in China. Yeah, that's all good, and, and it works in your office. And then some guy in China says, "Well, I'm going to sell it today," and it throws everything out of whack. <laughs> right, right. Or they got artificial intelligence computers playing against you, and they're going to take your money. Uh, Robert Breckner says, "I love this one. Show me your, show me your 
previous years of sales recommendations. Mm -hmm. So I like this one too. That and 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 I, you know, you can't, uh, you know, this year is is we're we're going to do good this year. I mean, there's there's going to be, uh, it's going to be fine. But uh, you know, the the previous years um, are really in is the proofs in the pudding there. And I I believe you know I've been doing this for 15 years, and. And we we've we've added money every year, and and we've grown big big farms into to, to bigger farms, and 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 a lot of the the reasons that we are successful is we look at a return on investment and and the risk and reward. And in an earlier question on cost of production, it's about building on what you've got every year and not giving any back. And and you know a lot of guys will you know, shoot for the moon and they'll make a lot of money, but they'll give it back for two or three years after that. It's about building every year. And, and that's really, you know, the importance of, of, of uh, having a good solid plan and, and looking at uh, cost of production, return on investment and growing it every year. So I'm proud to say that, that our, our, his, our, uh, our track record's pretty darn strong. And, and I think Terry would attest to that. <laughs> awesome. Rusty Stin. Asks, Our how do you run. cover your ass? Yeah, you know, you know Rusty? You bet. Agritrain guy. Okay, good. I, I don't know Rusty. I've never met Rusty. Appreciate his question. How do you cover your ass when you do pre-sell and then come up short to cover the sale? Nobody nobody knew it was you coming on the show, by the way. I just said green marketing coach. How okay. do you cover your ass when you do pre-sale and then come up short to cover the sale? What would have been the correct way to cover your position when you made the sale? So again, uh, use active gods as much as you can. You know, that's not available for all commodities on a year like this. So active gods whenever you can. Uh, but you know what we did was, you know, it, as if we made a sale at fifteen dollars a bushel for canola, for example, um, and then the market went to sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, we bought futures and covered our butts with that. So the money that you're making the futures account is basically what your buyout cost is going to be to get out of it. So you're even at that point. Sounds good to me. Sounds really good to me. Sign <laughs> me up. Final question. You're going to love this one. Yeah. Jason Beck, BX Farms. Why would anyone pay for your services ever again? <laughs> Because it's a long term thing, like it, and and I don't. He must be caught short on a contract and and be looking at huge <laughs> bio con uh, costs because that's, you know, that's you know, that's I'm assuming that somebody's helped him with you know with that and and he's got got himself caught. Again, it's about risk reward. We you know we we're very careful about you know and, and maximizing uh, revenue, but optimizing and and making sure that we're 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 not at, at hanging our butts out there. So, and it's a long-term uh, deal. Like you're, you're, you might get stung on a year like this, or obviously he's getting stung on a year like this. But if you look at the history of the last 15 years, again, it's about building equity and uh, not getting your ass out there too far. It's about um, you know, just hitting doubles and triples and not swinging for the fences every time. We should probably should have asked Terry that why he continues. <laughs> and uh, obviously, there's been a lot of great, great long-term value there. And and again, back to the original thesis of our of our conversation about coaching. Sometimes, even if a wrong decision is made, just making it with others is far better than making a wrong decision on your own. Um, yeah, that's right. It's a very lonely thing to be making decisions with all the money involved here. And I, I found that too. In the beginning of our business, I just charged ahead, uh, much to the dismay of my other shareholders and various other people. Now it's one of those things where you take a deep breath, you sleep on it, you work with the experts, you don't do anything major without the buy-in of everybody. So if things go sideways, I mean, there's been all kinds of things on the farm. You know, you, you were there. I mean, there's been times when they had $900,000 of hemp inventory they couldn't move to the market and they had to get it, you know, the, work with the bank to get it, you know, registered as as inventory and, and keep rolling and frosts. And, and a lot of that, um, I think, uh, Terry kept adding pieces that he knew would help in situations like that to the point where I think the farm's in a very robust location, but it's, it's all, you know, geographically, as far as, as the whole landscape goes um, on the war map, it, it takes a lot of management to get there. And he's yes. uh, been learning a lot. You know, my dad, God bless him, loves to like call grain, like on a Sunday, that's his yeah. jam. You know, yeah. working with advisors and getting other people's advice about what to do in life is not his jam. But my brothers, 
you know, that's really been his mantra and, and it's, it's spilled over into our company. It's, it's been awesome. So I look forward to the many ways that, um, you're going to continue to work with Aberhart farms and yep. some of what's been going on at Aberhart farms obviously is going to translate hopefully into other opportunities for Aberhart egg and, and all the producers that are listening to this show today. So, uh, where can people find you, uh, Derek, if they wanted to, um, hire you or ask you more? Well, um, yeah, I can, you know, my, my contact number, cell number is, uh, 306-435-9344. You can reach me at that. That's, that'll start a conversation. So <laughs> pretty straightforward. Love it. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Derek, and keep up the good work. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. 